I have Cayenne's latest flagship amp in for review. Can you see it? It's this one. So the first thing I noticed when I got the C9 out of the box was how small it is. I mean, the front profile is well, pretty, pretty tiny. I mean, I think pictures don't show it well because we're used to seeing 6.3 millimeter or quarter inch sockets on devices. And I think when we realize this only has 3.5 and 4.4, then you realize actually how small it is. I mean, the front profile you see is pretty tiny. I mean, compare that to say, I've got an N6 Mark II here, which has got the, well, it's got the EO2 module in it. And there's the 4.4 socket on that. So this is a pretty big dap as things go. So yeah, it's not really that dramatically larger, except maybe in length. It's actually quite a bit longer than a player. But not, well, a fair bit larger. It's not something you're going to stick in your pocket like you would a portable player. And just for another comparison, here's an N6 Mark II. It's obviously thicker. I mean, probably not a good comparison because I have cases on both these players. And the N6 Mark II is a very thick, chunky dap as things go. Here's the R6 2020 with a case on it. But it, so it's not dramatically larger. Maybe a more apt comparison would be the IFI Diablo, which it's kind of similar size to that. So we get the Diablo out here and have a look. Kind of, yeah, I think, well, it seems to be it's the same length, but the other dimensions, it's a little, the Diablo is smaller. It's not quite as thick. So we're looking at kind of this kind of size. It's like a, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a DAC in it, but it's dedicated as a amplifier. What it does have, of course, is the Korg new tubes, which I'll give you the requisite uh, shot of them glowing in a little bit. And in features otherwise, it has, well, a battery pack inside and quite a few options now you're thinking you know two thousand dollars for an amplifier well you know i have head amps gsx mini in here which is about close to around eighteen hundred dollars and that's just an amp this has quite a bit more in it now of course it has the tube option but let's have a look it's microprocessor controlled inside so if i switch it on it doesn't just switch on it uh you see the, the light flashes there and it sets itself up. And it will not just, you know, you don't just plug in things and play. It's obviously designed to have take some care towards, you know, not doing something like accidentally blowing your ears out with high volume, for example. And so, for example, if you plug stuff in, then it actually does a, it do, has, does a little thing which is a little bit unusual. So here are some adapters that are the that come in the in the box. We have a 4.4 millimeter and a 3.5. A note that the 4.4 millimeter apparently the ground connection isn't connected, so some devices that require the ground connection may may not be happy. I haven't tested anything specifically, but you know the DAPs that I've used usually don't use the ground connection anyway. They probably should, but that's another discussion. So what happens is if you plug something in, well, so I plug in say this 4.4 millimeter, it obviously uses the uh, the connectors and the, the not a signal but uh, part of the connectors inside to in, for the uh, amp to know that something is plugged in. And then I have some Audio Dream IEMs with a cable I had spare for so I could use balanced with them, and I plug that in and watch the light. It'll now flash and then set itself up and then connect. And if you switch from balanced to single ended, it'll flash again. So it won't just jump over and nothing will short and Given in-ear monitors can be quite sensitive and easier to damage, that's quite a good thing. It's some, some care has been taken to ensure that you know your gear and your ears are protected. Now, when you're switching between features, and we can talk about that, you have a similar kind of thing. Some care has been taken so that when switching stuff over, it's done with some forethought. Now, Class A and Class AB switches you know fairly quickly there's a little bit of a delay and then there's a switch over and that's of course to ensure the circuit stabilizes going from the solid state to tube mode there's a very clever one now they have to, the tubes require a few seconds to warm up so what happens when you switch if you do while playing music 
is it will continue playing in solid state mode until the tubes have warmed up, which is about five seconds, and then it will switch over. So there'll be a little bit of a click and then you're in tube mode. The volume control too is electronically controlled. So when you adjust it, it's not just a volume pot. You can hear the very subtle little click, 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 click as the volume goes up and down. It's very, very subtle. Nothing that will interfere with music is because the, they're using an electronic volume control inside. And high and low gate is instant because it's just a switch. No, no, nothing unique there. Now, the interesting thing is the line and pre-mode. Now, pre-mode is if... Now, a lot of people apparently have been using this with a Chord Hugo 2. And the Chord Hugo 2 is an excellent volume control. It's way better than any regular digital volume control, or analog one for that matter. And so what happens when you switch to preamp mode is it doesn't just go into preamp mode, which would max, you know, bypasses the volume control because, it, of course, you'd blow your ears out or damage your in-ear monitors. So actually switching this will do nothing. What you have to do is everything has to be plugged in and ready. So I'm going to, to demonstrate that I have to plug stuff in again. And they have a very clever system for doing this. Once everything's plugged in, now this all has to be ready, you switch it into pre-mode, and then on the side there's another button here. And you press and hold that for three seconds. And you hear the click and the little light comes on. Now you're in preamp mode where the volume control is bypassed. And if you do anything at all, like switching things, not, not the switches, but if you pull out anything like the inputs or the outputs, what happens is it disconnects preamp mode. So it resets if anything is plugged in or removed. And that absolutely ensures that you're not going to accidentally leave it in preamp mode or have it in preamp mode and damage either your in-ear monitors or your ears. Very clever thinking. So actually it's more of a sophisticated device than just an amp. It's actually very well thought out. Now the other thing that's very good about this is the, the problem we have say with portable players is what happens when your battery starts to wear out after so many years of use. Well then it becomes a little bit of a problem because opening these things are not always easy to open up. Now the C9 has been designed with some forethought. Now the normal charging is via a USB-C socket, as you see here, and it has, shows the uh, battery level if it's powered on. But this is a battery pack. So if we turn it on its side and we get out a, star, a T7 star driver, we can actually pop out the battery pack. And you can get replacements from Kyin too, because the battery pack uses da -da, standard high power batteries. And the kind of things that you get in, well, like for me, I call them you know, high power torch batteries, like in my Eagle Tac. Uh, other people will know them as vaping batteries, that kind of thing. They're actually they're readily available, and you can you can get them and you replace them easily. And of course, it's a separate pack. So if you get a second one, you can actually charge up one pack while you're using the, a second. So it's quite well thought out. Just an interesting thought is that literally half this thing is batteries. So there's a lot of power behind this. Now we did there was a, a 11 Audio in in Tai we're well now in Taiwan also has a uh, battery powered amp but it's considerably larger but it's amazing how much power you can get out of these because the amp itself has up to four watts of power now if we look in our in a, the power table for the amp it is in the balanced outputs will actually up, output four watts at 16 ohms so if you're i think there are not many 16 ohm headphones around i think dan clark audio eons are 16 ohm and they well so here four watts into a a pair of DCA Eons, that's probably way, way, way overkill, but it's still got a good couple of watts. You've still got plenty, even at uh, 32 ohms, which most, say, planar headphones are. So you're more than enough power to give you plenty of overhead for, you know, music, even at fairly high volumes. And you probably all want to see the new tubes glowing. So actually, to get the new tubes glowing, I have to plug everything in again. But as things go, the feature-wise, it's actually fairly reasonably sophisticated. Now you can see the little glowing, the two little glows there on each side. Just very faint blue glows. Korg new tubes are interesting because they're based on a kind of old display technology, or older display te technology, and they don't actually use a lot of power like regular vacuum tubes do. Regular vacuum tubes need a higher voltage. Even the small ones like in the uh, N3 Pro which were kind of old hearing aid batteries, still require a fair amount of you know voltage to be supplied to get them running. These require you can I mean Korg has Korg made some DIY 
amps which just use 9 volt batteries. I mean, they, they're very, very, very low powered as things go. They don't require much power at all. So you see the tube switch off there as soon as I unplug. So it's very sophisticated in terms of setup. And it's a beautiful little lamp, isn't it? And so you probably the next thing to talk about is how it performs sonically. I ran the C9 mostly with Chords Hugo 2 or out of one of the modules from the N6 Mark II, say such as the line out from this T01 module I have here, or in line out mode, for example, from this EO2. But as things go, there are some differences in performance between the single ended and balanced outputs of the Cayenne C9. So there's kind of a lot to get through because I went from you know very sensitive in-ear monitors such as the Campfire Audio Aras, in which I have this Fio LCRE cable at the moment, up to you know very hard to drive stuff like full-sized headphones and these the Audio Dream Diabolis, Diaboli. And these kind of you know lead desktop amp power to be driven most ideally. So it was quite a challenge to get everything going with the C9. Well, let's just talk about performance issue set up with uh, the C9. I just want to look at the specifications for a minute. Now, most of them you can, apart from power, you can ignore you know, turtle harmonics and, and noise and all that kind of thing. There's some differences, but nothing that's going to have any significant difference from, you know, you know not anything you're really going to hear the, an audible difference with, like 114 versus 123 decibels, where you're not going to really hear that. Obviously, going to the vacuum tube, you know, you are lowering the uh, sound quality in measurable terms, but maybe not in audible terms. It's going to have any, a slight effect that... Things like the harmonics that might appear may be slightly different, and that's kind of what was audible, but I'll talk about that in a bit. The one I want to talk about is channel separation or crosstalk. This is the one you should look in with everything. Now, I'd love if I had a graph that showed the crosstalk, you know, with different setups. That would be most informative, but I don't, but we're just going to use the numbers here. Now, we'll notice that with single-ended to single-ended or balanced to single-ended down here, the channel separation or crosstalk is actually well, a, a low number, which is not so, not quite so great. We're kind of into the uh, audible range here, and I'll talk about how that affects sound in a little bit. But we notice if we're going single-ended to balanced, it's much better, and balanced to balanced, it's most optimum. So I think using a Hugo 2 to a C9 is maybe not technically the most optimum, but people are using this because they want there maybe a slightly you know tubey sound signature added to their Hugo 2 which I totally understand as I used it even a Hugo 2 to a basic uh, Cavalli tube hybrid sometimes just to give a little bit of sweetness to the sound or to my ALO Audio Studio 6 because for the same reason you do lose a tiny bit of fidelity in exchange for a little bit of well tubey sound and you know you think well why don't you just EQ and the reason people buy things like the C9 is because they want, because they want the maximum sound quality but a little bit of kind of something extra to the sound with something like the Hugo 2. Just a little bit of tubiness in there, a little bit of uh, even order harmonic distortion, something like that, but maintaining the high sound quality and the high power drive. Now, if you have a portable player which has a lower power output, such as this uh, N6 Mark II, which still drives headphones pretty well, if you are driving full-sized headphones and you want a very small compact amp, then this is going to be very ideal. And that was what I wanted to test. So. What I did with the Hugo 2 is I added a device which is unfortunately no longer obtainable. It's a balanced transformer. And so this takes either a balanced or single-ended input using the kind of 3.5mm Hi-Fi Man pinout and outputs 2.5 or 3.5mm balance. So you can actually go from single-ended to balanced with it. And I daisy-chained that to the Hugo 2 so I could use the balanced input and hopefully excellent performance there. Now, but also use the, uh, as again, the N6 Mark II. So one of the first things I decided to do was test the noise level. And that I just do simply by plugging in, you know, the good old ARAs. Well, Andromeda's will do just as well because they are equally very sensitive in-ear monitors. Now, I plug these into the Hugo 2, and I can hear a tiny little bit of hiss. And it was likewise the same kind of performance out of the C9. There was a tiny bit of hiss. So no loss there, but... Still not the completely silent like some desktop amps, especially IEM dedicated ones or things like the Singer SA1, which has you know a completely black background. But still, the performance of this is going to be the Singer SA1. So not a big issue there. The only issue I did have is now people will probably want to use the Hugo 2 
using the Hugo 2's volume control because it's way better than a volume pot or anything else or even a regular digital volume control due to the heavy amount of or the, the huge amount of processing available to make it most optimum that exists in the Hugo 2. So for that I select put it in pre-mode and then hooked up, uh, hooked up the Hugo 2 and put it in pre-mode. But there was too much noise for it to work with the Aras. With other ear earphones and any, you know, headphones and that kind of thing, no problem. But just for the Aras and very sensitive IEMs, pre-mode was just no good in that kind of setup. So that was kind of a little bit of a, a disappointment, but not a showstopper because I think don't think a lot of people don't have campfire audio in-ear monitors. And using the volume control, well, that wasn't a huge loss. I think the sound was a little bit clearer bypassing the volume control with other in-ear monitors and headphones. Tiny bit, but still, the volume control didn't, didn't deteriorate things, you know, any large degree. So how about the other things like tube mode? Well, tube mode made things a little bit kind of sweeter sounding. Now there is, of, of course, a measurable slight loss in technical performance, but still, it, it kind of, it's solid state mode was everything like straight down the line, clear, sharp, you know, excellent performance. Tube mode added a little bit of sweetness to that, so softened things up a tiny bit and made things kind of more spaced, evenly spaced out, that kind of performance which was very pleasant. Class A and Class A B mode. Class A is a little bit kind of sharper, clearer, and Class A B mode is maybe a tiny bit kind of more exciting sounding and a little bit less clear. So it's kind of a, it was very fine tuning going on between these. So I often went for tube mode, but in Class A mode was one of my preferred setups because I like that kind of sharpness of Class A, but with a slight euphonic sound of the tube mode engage. But sometimes, you know, I just go, you go straight down the line, you get some very, very clear sound from the C9. I plugged it in incidentally on top of the Chord Hugo TT2 and M Scaler, which is, you know, yet another level up of, of clarity, just to see how much sonic loss I got going through the C9, and sometimes with or without the uh, a clear porter in there. And there was a little bit, but still, it very, very clear and very, very high quality sound coming through the C9, very much the kind of quality I'd expect from a high-end desktop amp. Now on the other end, driving power. With the Diabolis, which are really need a desktop amp to be optimum, because they have, I believe, uh, planar drivers in there as well as some electrostats, they drove really well out of the C9. Now, all that power was really worked great to have on hand for driving the Diabolis. And again, full-sized headphones, I felt that I was not losing anything driving them out of the C9. Really great performance there. I won't get into specifics about, you know, songs or tracks or that kind of thing. But I didn't feel like I was running out of power ever. Or uh, Now, I don't listen that loud, admittedly. I listen up to about 80 decibels, sometimes a little bit higher if, you know, I decide to listen a bit louder. But drive was generally pretty excellent. I think the only caution may be if people listen super loud, that's when you're going to be straining any kind of amp. And anyway, you're also going to be damaging your hearing. But there was no issues in, in kind of performance. It was seemed to pass through the music very cleanly and clearly in solid state mode and class A mode with that little bit of, you know, change in kind of well, as it said, timbre on there, or, or the uh, Class AB, making it a little bit more exciting. One of the interesting things that is notable about these modes, however, is the battery life. Now, if you put it in Class AB mode in solid state, you can get up to, and use the single-ended outputs, you can get up to 15 hours of battery life. However, as you go into things like balanced, as you engage the tubes, as you go in Class A mode, which will use, 100, you know, in a circuit will use 100% of the power 100% of the time, the battery life can go all the way down to only five hours. So there was a big jump in power usage there. So at a pinch, you may be, you know, power may be going down, you may be tipping it over and you go, oh, there's only a couple of dots left on the thing, I want to preserve battery life. Then you might go into solid state mode and, you know, class AB to kind of lower the power usage. So you do have this trade-off of features versus kind of power. The other thing with the single-ended and output, as I talked about, is that there is, you know, much greater crosstalk or channel separate, you know, much worse channel separation with single-ended. So I did try that. I tried single-ended to single-ended with the Aras and, you know, balanced to balanced. And there was a distinct change in, a very audible change in the performance between them. Now, this isn't simply because it's single-ended or balanced. This is because in this particular amp, it is optimized for balanced output. That is where you're going to get the most technically best performance. And you're going to get some crossover between the channels in the single-ended output. And it was noticeable because the single-ended output, you know, the soundstage sounded narrower, 
you know, the, the center image, the center part of the image, like the singer was like dead in the middle. With the kind of, it was more focused in the middle, so more closed in sounding. Whereas the balanced output kind of the, the mid image, you know, the instrument or singer or whatever in the middle was a bit more spaced out and the whole image kind of opened up. So there was a very audible difference in there. And still, it wasn't bad, you know, with 75 dBs of channel separation was still very good. So overall, as things go, performance with the C9 was pretty excellent. Now, it is a bit of a challenge at $2,000. I mean, there are a lot of great amps out there which are, you know, way less than that. And I've just got in, you know, for example, the head amp GSX Mini, which is a fantastic amp and is a couple hundred dollars cheaper. But what you get out of this is you get desktop level performance in a really tiny package. And that will really suit some people. I mean, I really consider it kind of a Hong Kong, Singapore device for people who have, you know, want to do the little tiny desktop stack with a you know, high-end DAP or something like that, but have, you know, desktop level performance on the output. Or, you know, people want to take a transportable rig and want to go super overkill with a Hugo 2 and and this for their, you know, their, their maximum synergy, because I realize that people in Asia really like their synergy. They'll go through, you know, half a dozen different IEM cables to get just the right one for their in -ear monitors and that kind of thing. That's where it's really at. So it's definitely a great little device and very, very sophisticated. I think probably the main criticism of it is I wish they'd included some rubber feet because, you know, but it's got a, it's got a cover on the, the plastic bottom there. So if you see all these scratches there, don't worry about it. It's just the cover. All the same, and in the fact that you can replace the batteries, that's very well thought out. The safety preamp setting safety, that was excellently thought out. The microprocessor controlling of you know plugging stuff in and, and you know disconnecting the circuit until stuff is plugged in and settled, really well thought out. And the, you know the subtle options where you can fine tune the sound, very well thought out as well. So it's a really great little device, and it's just you know beautifully made as well. So I hope that gave you a clear overview. Don't forget, if you do want to see my videos in advance or ask my advice about audio gear, consider becoming a patron. Help me out a bit and I'll happily help you out as much as you need. And you can check out all my impressions of gear like this soon after it arrives rather than having to wait for me to shoot the video. Thanks very much to Kyan for sending one of these over. And thanks everyone who has been supporting me up till now. And I look forward to seeing you all online.